Uh, today, we're going to conclude our vision series. Uh, for the last three weeks, we have been, or the, including this week, we're talking about the three identifying features of what it means to be the people of God, uh, and in particular, the organizing principles that make us a local church. Uh, I've loosely organized this vision series in the fall around our three maxims as a church. How many of you know our three maxims as a church? Do you know what they are? Yeah. Loving God, right? What's the second one? Prioritizing, Prioritizing people. And third? And blessing, the world. and blessing the world. Yes. So loving God, that upward dimension to the Christian life. Prioritizing people, this inward horizontal dimension to the Christian life. And now blessing the world, this outward dimension to the Christian life. And if we're going to embrace what the Bible describes, what it means to be his people, we actually need to be a people who are concerned about organizing our rhythms and our habits around these three dimensions. This is what it means to be the church. We are a worshiping community on mission together. Let me say that again. We are a worshiping community on mission together. And I'm going to focus on that last maxim today, blessing the world. I want to talk about the missio Dei, the mission of God, in particular, what it means for us to be a kingdom community. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 to 20, or actually chapter, uh, verse 10 to 20, if you have your Bibles. If you, if you don't have your Bible, follow the words on the screen. This is what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here's how missional thinker Jeff Vanderstelt describes the church or defines the church. Jeff Vanderstelt once said, the church is all the people who through faith in the crucified and risen Jesus now belong to God as citizens in his kingdom and members in his family. So what this is saying is that the church is not primarily a place. The church is not a place. The church isn't a location. The church is a people. But it's more than that. It's a people who belong to God and belong to one another. That God has reconciled us to himself so that we are now part of his family. That God is our father and you and I become brothers and sisters in Jesus. And so the church is this family, and as a family, we love each other. At least we're supposed to, right? We serve each other. At least we aspire to. Am I correct? And we don't give up on one another. We're committed to seeing the image of Jesus come into clear focus, not just for ourselves, but for one another. As much as we're concerned about our own conformity to the image of Christ, we're equally concerned about others' conformity to the image of Jesus. Like Jesus, we're looking to the needs of others, even above our own interests and our own needs. And so to be the church, to live up to the calling that God has for us, it means that we have to be devoted to one another that we're devoted to working things out, that we're a family here. Just, just like Jesus doesn't give up on us, we don't give up on one another. Because of Jesus, we are a people who belong to one another. And I wanna just say, I, want to, I, I just wanna say that we're a people who belong to one another, but we're also a people on mission together. The church is not just a community, it's a kingdom community. We're citizens of another kingdom. But to talk about what that actually means, we need to talk about what 
the good news actually is, what the gospel actually talks about. Because I think when we talk about the gospel story, we tend to overfocus on the beautiful truth, the true truth, that Jesus came to save me. There's this focus on the gospel as a means of personal salvation. This is what we often call the gospel of our salvation. That in order for you to be saved, you need to have a personal relationship with God and know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. How many of you have heard those words before? That that's what the gospel is. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The story goes like this. God created us for relationship with himself, but we sinned against God, and as such, we are separated from God and alienated from God and under God's condemnation. But God, instead of condemning us, in his great love for us, sent his son to bear our punishment. And so Jesus, when he went to the cross, he was taking the sins of all of the unrighteous, that's all of us in the room, all of our unrighteousness, he places it upon himself, and he died in our place, and and he bore that judgment. In other words, on the cross, God took an eternity of what we deserve and bound it up in a moment, and he unleashed it on his beloved son. And Jesus absorbed the wrath of God against sin on our behalf. My sins and your sins for those of us who are in Christ today. And he bore our sins so that we could be forgiven and set free and brought into right relationship with God, forgiven and made part of his family. And now the way that we receive all of this is through what? Through faith. Faith in Jesus, faith in the work that he's done on the cross, crossing the line of faith. In other words, I give up on myself. I'm putting my faith and trust and assurance in Jesus Christ. I'm not trusting in my own virtues for salvation. I'm trusting in Jesus' virtue, his work, his righteousness. It's like that song by Michael W. Smith called Above All. Someone said, oh. (laughs) Who was that? Who was that? Oh. You know that song, Above All? The chorus, crucified, laid behind the stone, you live to die, rejected and alone, and then here's the really sentimental part, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall and you thought of me. You thought of me above all. Now as beautiful and as sentimental as this song is, the thesis of this song is this, that Jesus on the cross, when he died for the world, he died for you and for me, he died for names and faces and personal narratives. Think about that for a second. That is a breathtaking truth, isn't it? As much, we may not like this song, (laughs) there's one person who doesn't like this song, (laughs) but it is a beautiful truth, is it not? It's a simple truth. But I wanna say this, it does not adequately describe the full story of the gospel. It is not a full gospel. As Scott McKnight says, it's true, but it's an incomplete story. Now, when I was a teenager, as a teenager, teenagers tend to be, and for me, for sure, tend to be a little bit narcissistic. Anyone there? Anyone here as a teenager felt like the entire world revolved around you, as if you were like the main character of this story, and everything was really all about you? Anyone here? Any secret narcissists here? Okay. Psychologists have a term to, to describe that phenomenon. It's called the spotlight effect. Has anyone ever heard of the spotlight effect before? The spotlight effect is the tendency for people to believe that others are paying more attention to them than they actually are. So if you're a teen and you're walking down the street with mismatched socks, you're feeling really self-conscious about that, thinking that absolutely everybody is noticing your mismatched socks. And the truth is, is that no one is thinking about your mismatched socks. Why? Because everyone is thinking about their own mismatched socks. And listen, I'm not just ragging on teenagers, it's everywhere, everything in our lives, practically every message that you will receive in the culture that we inhabit, the mantra of everyday life is everything is about you. It's all about you. Social media runs on algorithms that know your habits, your schedules, your routine so well 
uh, that they're feeding all of this information to sell you stuff that you don't need. Ad companies, ad companies know what kinds of things that you like to buy. Now think about this, they even know what time of day you're most susceptible to buying things. How scary is that? I think for men it's like past 11 o'clock at night. You're most susceptible to buying things that you don't want or you don't actually need. Now think about this, the more you use social media, the more it knows about your wants, your dislikes, and your political leanings, and as a result, confirmation bias is amplified through these algorithms that are, pre- that are predicated on selling you stuff. Every time you click a heart or a thumbs up or a thumbs down, it's feeding this algorithmic beast more information about your wants, your dislikes, your desires, your longings, only for those things to be then curated and fed back to you in in an infinite loop as you just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. We live in this me-focused and wants focus narrative, and the danger becomes that we even extend this narcissism to the story of the gospel, where we overly fixate the gospel on me. It's about me. And here's what I'm trying to point out. If you live your Christian life focused only on you, your personal salvation, only on your own personal growth, your own personal happiness, your own walk with God, if you focus only on trying to level up in the faith or trying to better yourself, if that's the focus of the gospel story, God's about, it's, God, it's about me and my sanctification and my glorification. It's about me achieving my full potential in this life. God, you've come to bring me into the fulfillment of my deepest dreams and ambitions in this life, there's a danger that this vein of thinking leads to a narcissistic gospel. That place, that, that places ourselves at the center of God's story of salvation. And we hear this kind of preaching in what's called the prosperity gospel, that places you at the center of God's redemptive story. As if God is your cosmic butler, who wants to bless you and serve you and empower you in fulfilling your greatest dreams so that you can, quote, live your best life now. Now listen, the gospel is so much bigger than that. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, the good news that Jesus announces, yes, it includes you, but I wanna say this in love, it is so much bigger than you. So much bigger than you. Furthermore, God's power God's power isn't for your own fulfillment and enhancement in this life. I want to say this clearly. God's power is for God's purposes. God's power is always for his purposes. And this is what Paul is talking about in our passage in Colossians. He's giving us a compelling vision for just how grand, how cosmic the mission of God is. Just how large his salvation is. Look at verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So there's this beautiful reality that Paul's reminding of us that all of our sins are forgiven, the gospel of our salvation. We've been forgiven of our sins, redeemed and reconciled to God. But keep reading, verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church, he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, I don't know about you, but that's quite the resume for Jesus, isn't it? If you've placed your full confidence in Jesus, you're forgiven, absolutely. You're redeemed by God, absolutely. But there's also something even bigger going on here. This isn't just a battle for your soul. This is a cosmic battle between two kingdoms and everything is at stake when it comes to the gospel. 
And Jesus fully intends to reconcile all things. Say it with me. All things to himself. We call this the gospel of the kingdom. Look at that last verse. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In Genesis 3, at the start of the story, at the beginning of the Bible, when Adam and Eve sin, we tend to overfocus on humanity's being severed, humanity's relationship being severed from God, but we often fail to recognize that all of the domains of existence have been severed and broken. In the curse, God curses the serpent, makes it crawl on its belly. God causes childbearing to be painful. He says, in pain, in pain you shall bring forth children. This isn't just referring to the actual pains of labor, although I'm sure that that was painful, although I have no idea. It also refers to the sting and heartbreak that mothers and fathers feel when their very children that, that have been they brought into the world, that there's discord and bitterness in the family relationship. In other words, parenting as a result of sin is so painful. It's tear-filled because of sin. God says because of sin, even a husband and wife, their relationship will be marked by a constant power struggle, a relationship that was intended to be face-to-face, where a husband and wife are supposed to rule together and submit to one another and appreciate each other's giftedness. Sin has distorted this relationship into not ruling together and serving one another, but rather it's distorted human relationships in always trying to rule over one another, always trying to get someone in subjection to yourself. It says a woman will desire to overtake her husband, but more often than not, it will be the domineering husband who rules over his wife. This is not something to celebrate. Even the ground is cursed in the creation story. God says to Adam, it's going to be by the sweat of your brow that you're gonna toil and produce from the ground. You're gonna gonna try to rule over the natural world, but here's the thing, the natural world is always going to bite back. Do you see what I'm saying? Sin has spiraled everything out of control into the domain of darkness, and Adam and Eve's fall was the the trigger that spiraled everything out of sync with God's beautiful intention and his beautiful design. Everything was shattered and vandalized that day. Humanity has fallen out of relationship with God. Human relationships have been absolutely corrupted and shattered. Familial relationships broken and fractured right from the the beginning. So much so that the first story of human siblings ends in a murder. This is the opening pages of the Bible. And even God's creation is under a curse. So much so that Paul says in Romans 8.22, that creation groans to be lifted from this. Have you ever thought about this? Every time you hear your dog groaning on the couch as it's shuffling around, maybe, just maybe, that that groan is that deep instinctual groan saying, things are not supposed to be this way. (laughs) You ever think that your your terrier has that, that, that much awareness of what's actually going on in the grand scheme of things? This is the world that we live in. When we're born, we don't naturally love God, we don't seek God, we don't want God, we rebel against God, and we find substitutes for God. And more often than not, the number one substitute for God is ourselves. We exalt ourselves, we love ourselves, we serve ourselves, we prioritize our own agenda, and we're so out of sync with God, and we're so out of sync with his heart. But also, human relationships are shattered. This is why we have broken homes and broken families. This is why we have child abuse. This is why we have human trafficking. This is why we have sexual exploitation. This is why we have racism and systemic injustice. This is why we have rioting and looting and police brutality. This is why we have tribalism and inequality along socioeconomic lines. This is why we have suffering. This is why we have wars and genocide. This is why we have slavery. And listen, we're even out of sync with this world. This is why we have sickness and famine and suffering and disease and even death. All of these things are intruders to to God's good world. Now, God could have kicked us to the curb. 
He could have just said in Genesis 3, I'm done with this disaster and did away with it all, but God loves this world even in its fallen and broken condition, and he determines to rescue it and save it. And this is why in Genesis 3, when he pronounces the the curse that sin has brought on, he also makes a great promise. He says to Eve that someone from your lineage, that there will be someone born from a woman who is going to crush the head of this serpent, crush the head of this curse. He says in Genesis 3.15, speaking of the child, that he will crush the serpent's head and you shall bruise his heel. What God is saying is that there is one who is coming who's going to undo the effects of the fall, who's actually going to lift the curse and overpower and overwhelm and overturn the impact of sin in this world. And you and I all long for this, don't we? I don't think I've ever met an individual on this planet that doesn't want this world to be a better place. And so you know from reading the rest of the story, if you read through the rest of the scriptures, This one who comes from the seed of this woman who crushes the head of the serpent, his name is Jesus. God's son, God the son, clothed in flesh, came among us as a savior king and he came to overthrow the kingdom of darkness. Think about the New Testament. When Jesus comes onto the scene, what's his favorite sermon? Do you know what Jesus' favorite sermon is? He's always like, repent and believe, why? for the kingdom of God has come near, right? He's always speaking about the kingdom, isn't he? The kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom is here to overthrow the darkness. And so in Matthew 12, Jesus casts out a demon and the Pharisees say, you cast out demons by the power of demons. And Jesus is like, think about that for a second. That doesn't make any sense. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Satan overthrowing Satan would be Satan's undoing. And then Jesus says this, but if I cast out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus is saying the kingdom is here. It's reclaiming what the intruder Satan stole. Jesus is here to recapture everything that was lost at Adam's fall. Jesus has come to bind up the strong man. He's come to restore and renew everything that has fallen out of place. Jesus has come to bring the saving rule and reign of God into creation and win back everything that was lost in Adam. Have you ever wondered why Jesus keeps preaching the kingdom? Have you ever wondered why he keeps saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Jesus walks the earth and he's saying, everyone, everyone, listen, pay attention. The kingdom, the kingdom is here. Now what on earth is he talking about? When Jesus announces the kingdom of God has come, people must have been so perplexed by that statement. They're like, well, it feels like just like, it feels like every other Tuesday, Jesus. Where's this kingdom that you speak about? But in this statement, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. What is he referring to? Did you, did you know he's actually referring to himself? He's saying everything you've ever wanted to know about God's kingdom the kingdom that's coming, you can see all of it fully in me. Have you ever watched a movie where the director just throws in a special cameo appearance that you were not expecting, right? Like in the movie, suddenly some famous actor appears, you're like, I know that guy, oh my goodness, and then it just goes on to the next scene. This is what Jesus' coming was like. In Jesus, the kingdom of God made a cameo appearance in the person of Jesus. In other words, the coming restoration, the renewal of all things, the world that we all really want, made its stunning full debut in the person of Jesus. Are you with me on this? This is what Jesus is doing as he announces the kingdom. The world that's coming, the world we all want, the world to come was visibly seen in the person of Jesus. And so when you look at the life and ministry of Jesus, this is what you'll see. You see Jesus pronouncing the forgiveness of sins and seeing people restored back to God. You see, you see Jesus healing the sick, showing us that, the world, that what the world's destined to become, that there's a day coming where there will be no more sickness, suffering, or disease. You see Jesus raising the dead. That's the kingdom of God, making an, making an appearance in Jesus because the world to come will be free of death. 
You see Jesus cast out demons, why? Because when the kingdom comes in all of its fullness, Satan and his power will be fully and finally vanquished. You see Jesus raising dead children. In Luke 7, he raises a widow's son. In Mark 5, he raises Jairus' daughter by saying, Talitha kum, little girl, rise. What's he doing? He's restoring children back to brokenhearted parents. He's bringing people from death to life, families from heartbreak to deep joy. When Jesus is on a boat and he's asleep and the boat is caught up in this massive storm and the disciples think they're gonna drown and so they wake up Jesus and they're like, listen, look at the wind and the waves. Don't you care, Jesus? And Jesus yawns and then he looks at the waves. He's like, oh, will you stop? And then like that, instantaneously, the wind and waves obey him. The sea becomes like glass. What is that about? That's the kingdom of God making its full debut in Jesus because one day this creation will finally be at peace again. You see Jesus in his ministry undoing all of the curses pronounced in Genesis 3. Humanity's relationship with God restored in Jesus. Our relationship with one another restored in Jesus. Even our relationship with the chaos of creation restored in Jesus. Even the powers of hell finally vanquished and defeated in Jesus. And so in Jesus Christ, we see the kingdom is already here. It's already here, fully established. Finally, it's it's established. And when Jesus ascended and poured out his Holy Spirit upon the church, the church became this kingdom community. And what this means is that the kingdom of God should still be on display every day today through the church, through his kingdom community. The kingdom was visible, it was tangible. When Jesus walked upon the earth, in Jesus you could taste the kingdom, you could see the kingdom, you could feel the kingdom, you could even hear the kingdom as Jesus preached. But then Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father, he pours out his Holy Spirit upon the church, and he says to all of us, even in this room today, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. What does this mean? The kingdom of God is still continuing to show up in his people. It's showing up in us. Look at Ephesians 3.10. Paul writes, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You and I, the church of Jesus Christ, were a sign of the coming kingdom. We are to show the world the features and contours of what God's kingdom looks like. The church is called to be a foretaste of the coming kingdom of God. I heard a pastor say it like this. We're kind of like the food samples at Costco. (laughs) So you go to Costco and you get the little, you know, you know those people at Costco that have like the little samplers that you get to come? Some of us go to Costco simply to get a free lunch, right? We're like, and if you're not full enough, you get a hot dog and a drink for $1.50. So you go to Costco and you see those little people, those people giving out those free samples and they give you this little tiny cup with like a meatball in it and you eat that meatball and it's like the most delicious, for, for whatever reason, those samples are always better than they actually taste in like when you buy the whole bag, right? You have one of them and they're just, it's so good and you're like, this is the best meatball I've ever heard and then they give you the good news of the meatball, the gospel of the meatball. They're like, guess what? Best news today, you can get a 40 kilogram bag of those meatballs <laughs> in the freezer section and they're on sale today. <laughs> now listen, the church, The church is kind of like that. The church is a sample. It's a morsel, a foretaste of what the kingdom of God is like. But here's the good news. One day that kingdom is coming in bulk. One day that kingdom is coming in bulk. One day the kingdom will come in full force and one day the kingdom of God is going to come in its fullness and make all things new. And the church is just a foretaste of that that people in our community should be able to encounter people in the church and say, oh, that's what God is intending for human relationships. 
Oh, that's what generosity means because of the way God's people see, who seek to be generous in the way that the Father is generous to all of us. They should be able to say, oh, that's what justice and peacekeeping should look like because of the way that God's people are concerned and involved in matters of justice and peace in the same way that God's heart longs for justice and peace upon the earth. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, it says, when the kingdom comes in all of its fullness, it will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall be, there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And so this means that the church needs to be active in wiping tears away now. When the kingdom comes in its, all of its fullness, it will demolish disease and suffering and poverty and hunger and injustice and wickedness and cruelty and oppression. God will one day eradicate these things because God is radically opposed to these things. Are you with me on this? They were not part of his original creation. They were, they were intruders into his world by the evil one. And the church, as citizens of the kingdom, we are to work against those things now. We are to be wiping away tears now. Why? Why? Simply because it's virtuous? Well, yes, in part, but we enter into the work of wiping away tears now also because it's a sign of, the, of what the world is destined to become. We cannot sit idly by just waiting for heaven. If we are to be disciples of Jesus, if we are his kingdom community, our mission is to actually work against the things that grieve the heart of our king the things that cause grief to his good world. Our mission is to help people and places experience renewal and restoration in Jesus, for people to get a taste, a foretaste of what God's coming kingdom is going to be like. This is what it means to be a kingdom community. Just like our savior, King Jesus, who showed compassion for human suffering, who showed compassion for the sick, for the enslaved, for those who were in bondage to the enemy, for those who were suffering and weeping. Like our king who showed compassion for us, we want to show compassion to all people. From the largest thing to the smallest thing. Whether it's a word of kindness or encouragement, whether it's through prayer and visiting those who are sick, praying for those who are sick and asking God to bring healing, whether it's through foster care, providing a home for a child who doesn't have one, whether it's through adoption or feeding the hungry, through taking care of the needs of the elderly or working towards reconciliation among races, this is what it means to be a kingdom community. This is what it means to participate with God in his mission to the world. It's bigger than just my own personal salvation. It's much, much bigger than my personal sanctifi sanctification and my eventual glorification. It's about joining with God, participating with God in bringing healing to a world that sin has ravaged and destroyed, and to do it little by little, one small act of obedience after another, and praying for God's kingdom to come fully and finally so that all things would be fully restored. A few years ago, as I close, uh, a few years ago, the school right across the street from us was torn down completely, and all the kids in this catchment area had to be bused for several years, I think, a couple of years? A couple of years to a different elementary school. Now, I wanna ask a question. Did anyone notice the absence of kids in our neighborhood during that two-year period of time? Some of us who were living here? Yeah, notice the absence of kids now here's a hard question to reflect upon. What if that were to happen to Redemption Church? If our church building, for whatever reason, was torn down and had to be rebuilt, oh, it's not actually happening, by the way, <laughs> but if it had to be rebuilt and our congregation had to move to a different neighborhood for a few years, here's a hard question. Would our neighbors notice our absence? Would they mourn the loss of this congregation for those years of displacement? God has called every single individual in our church to be the tangible presence of his kingdom. He wants you and me, us together, to show people, to express to people God's heart for them, to see God's gracious rule and reign, what it will look like when the kingdom finally comes in all of its fullness and all of its glory. And we do all of this through both 
the words that we speak and the deeds, our hands, the, th- the stuff that we put our hands to. And I'd like to suggest today, this morning, that our statement on mission is just completely too broad. Our statement on mission right now is bless the world. And I think that that's too broad. And I'd like to suggest today that we should clarify that, that we're called to bless the world with both the message and the mercy of Jesus Christ. We're called to bless the world with both the message and the mercy of Jesus Christ. It has to be both. It has to be both a willingness to share the message of the gospel to our neighbors, but also in demonstrating the scandalous, gracious mercy of Jesus to our neighbors to pour out the radical generosity, the scandalous mercy that we've all received in King Jesus, to pour out that on others so that people and places can experience a foretaste of the kind of renewal and restoration that Jesus will bring with him when his kingdom comes in all of its fullness. Let me pray for us to that end. So Jesus, we pray right now that prayer at the end of the book, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. We need so much more of you in our lives, in our relationships. And Jesus, we need a greater vision for what salvation looks like. The ways that you're calling each and every single one of us, Lord, to be part of this kingdom community to give repeated opportunities for people to taste and see that you're good, to get a foretaste of what the coming kingdom is going to look like. And I pray right now in this space, Lord Jesus, that you would do a work of creativity and courage in our hearts today. Lord, to call us into the ways that you're calling each of us to participate in this kingdom work. Would you give us a holy imagination for the ways that we, to, to, the, in, in the ways that we view our vocation? Would you give us a holy imagination for the ways that you view our neighborhood in the ways that you're calling us, Lord, to be a blessing, to be people committed to speaking both the message and committed, Lord, to employing the mercy of you, God? We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite Maureen to come on up.